Tuesday, March the 12th. Thank you for being uh, with me here. And a uh, nice positive day in markets to report to you in the indices. The Dow is up 235 points. The S&P was up over a percent and NASDAQ was up one and a half. So uh, positive across the board. There was a little weakness across treasury curve, um, but not a lot, pretty modest. Uh, yields rose on 10 year, about five basis points. We closed at 415. So all this was was fairly positive on the day. Um, but yesterday was, you know, it's coming off of yesterday's down day, um, which was angst over today's CPI number. And then we get the CPI number. And of course, it's about in line. Um, core was slightly higher, but I mean, like half of a percent or something. It, it was it was just barely uh, uh, just barely higher uh, than than expected. We got 0.4 percent for the month of February for both headline and then taking out food uh, and energy for core also 0.4 percent. The year over year number for uh, headline was 3.2 percent which was slightly higher than the 3.1% the last read. And then for core, it was 3.8 year over year, which was slightly higher, but basically in line from 3.7 that we had last time. So, you know, all this to say, um, I've said this before, but the path to two, two things. One, it won't be a straight line exactly, so it's not linear. <clears throat> so you get little bumps in the road. The market was up today because, again, I think the numbers were, were essentially in line, really. But it was it was affirming in that the January, you know, what was telegraphed at least is very hot, you know, tick up in inflation to 0.4 for the month um, is looked at now as more of a one off again, a bump in the road, not necessarily a, a permanent longer term trend. So markets tend to like that. And then, of course, just having the, the news and not worrying about what it could be uh, is is sometimes supportive to markets. Uh, so all those things um, on CPI are good. And then the second part was, and I've said this before, in fact, we've written about it a couple of different times, but just understand that the shelter component inside of that number is is still at a 6% read. I think it was 5.97. And that's a third of, of how they measure CPI. And if you look at, uh, which is a year over year number, by the way, that 5.97. So it's capturing a higher number in the in the front end. If you look at the actual Zillow rent index, uh, which is more like two and a half percent, and then you would have swapped those two and put it in there for CPI calculation, you're already at the target or pretty darn close in the twos. So I think that we'll get there. And um, that's what we're looking at, at least uh, on the inflation front. Markets seem to like it for the day. I put some data in there on labor force participation. I don't think I've written about it recently, but just sort of a checkup, almost like a report card of where we are in the labor force. Participation. We're at about 62% participation rate, anybody 16 years and older in the country, which I give sort of a B minus, C plus, I guess, which isn't great. You know, something over, say, 66 or 67 would be, uh, would be better, historically speaking. So we're on the low end of uh, participation. And the reason is, and it's bifurcated. If you look at um, 25 year olds to 54 year olds, which is a, a, the biggest kind of part of the the meat or the middle of the uh, the labor force, we're looking great. We're at 83% participation in the labor force. Historically, that's above where we've been. And so that number I give an A. I think that's a good, good number. Um, and then if you look at anything above 54 years and older, or sorry, 55 years and older, that's yeah, pretty abysmal. It, it, it's a weird phenomenon. I, I, I guess there's some intuitive numbers around it, but um, during the pandemic, that participation rate just fell off a cliff. So people retired early, essentially. <clears throat> and um, the good news is, is the standard of living in this country is is of one high enough that people can get away doing that um, for all the negative things that you could say. Um, but it's uh, it's thirty eight percent. So historically, that's very low, um, and it's just down from where it was and below trend line. So if you add all that together. You sort of get a, a, a you know, a, a, a B, I guess, or a B minus maybe on uh, labor force participation. It's a little lower than I'd like to see, but um, at the end of the day, because we still have, albeit small, but we still have population growth in this country. It's not negative, in other words. We're not, we don't have a declining population. We still have people having babies, believe it or not, and we still have immigration. Um, the uh, that that's an advantage if you look at other places in the world you know, for example, China or Europe or Japan, 
or population is generally declining, you know, given participation around the same, then it's hard to really, it's harder to grow GDP. And that's why you end up with a declining or slower GDP environment in those places. And I, I said that because I think there's still something to be said about uh, positive population growth in the U.S. Um, David had a nice comment in there about valuations. Um, and really it was, you know, where we were now compared to the year 1999. Um, back then you still had 43% uh, of the index that was trading at 15X or cheaper, even though it was still overvalued and particularly technology, there was still a big part of it, a big section of it that was trading it right at 15 times. And today that 43% uh, is only about uh, 25% now. So what it means is those top companies are, are skewing it even more than they were in 1999. And, um, and that's not necessarily a good thing. Um, of course, the companies now, as compared to 99, I believe are healthier, specifically in technology, positive earnings and all those sorts of things. But, you know, the, um, the top uh, five, you know, companies in the S&P 500 are trading over 30. Um, and so, you know, I, I think there's other places in, in the world and, and in the market <clears throat> to take a look at for valuation going forward. Um, the, um, there was a section in there, I get the question enough, I, I worry that I had at one point put, put it inside of DCT or DC Today. I hope I didn't. But the question is, when, when uh, we take on an account and it has a, a huge capital gain in it, what do we do? And I just walk it through. I mean, it depends on the situation. It depends on the client circumstances, all these sorts of things. But we've got a lot of tools to deal with it. And frankly, we deal with it on a weekly basis. So this isn't something that is unusual for us. Uh, divesting of, of appreciated securities. Um, we do surgically. We take our time. We use our internal tax team when we need to. Uh, and it, it'll go quite well. And I guess my advice is just, I, I get the taxes. Um, nobody wants to pay taxes. I understand that. But you know, you don't want to put the tax cart before the investment horse when you're trying to decide what you should do. You should own the right investments, period. Um, okay, uh, that's what I have for you today. I'm going to wrap it up tomorrow. We've got a pretty light day on the economic calendar. We'll see what Mr. Market brings us. But for that, I will uh, let you have a good night and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Mm -hmm.